Hi, welcome everyone and welcome to Collective Intellectuality. I'm Amy. And I'm Alex. And today we have Liz Jackson, who is a professor of international education at the University of Hong Kong. And Liz has authored numerous publications, including three recent books, Contesting Education and Identity in Hong Kong, Beyond Virtue, The Politics of Educating Emotions, and Questioning Allegiance, Resituating Civic Education, which also received the American Educational Studies Critics' Choice Book Award in 2020. Liz is also the immediate past president of the Philosophy of Education Society of Australasia. So we're very excited to have you here with us and, and thank you for joining us. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Um, so Liz, we wanted to begin with a kind of general question about educational philosophy and what it means to be a philosopher of education. Um, and you identify yourself as, as a philosopher of education. So yeah. what does it mean to work as a philosopher of education today in this historical context? And also, how do you approach your research as a philosopher of edu education? That's a great question. And um, so I do identify as a philosopher of education very strongly. Um, and I think, but I don't know um, if this, is something you're aware of, but actually a lot of people do con contest what is a good philosopher of education, as well as what role philosophers of education should be playing in societal debates today. Uh, so I was trained in the field of philosophy of education, and I understand it as a field where you apply philosophical ideas to educational issues. Um, so for many of us, we focus on the assumptions behind educational problems, as well as what are the overall goals of education and how do we achieve those goals or not achieve those goals in the case there's a mismatch. Uh, so I think a lot of people in society say like education should do this, education should help the economy or education should help young people face uh, challenges in the real world. Uh, so those are some views that people have and there's some assumptions underneath those views of the right kind of education to achieve those goals. Um, what we normally find is a mismatch between what we think education should be doing and what it actually is doing. And this is where I think everyone secretly has a philosophy of education, um, but not everyone identifies as a philosopher of education. When it comes to uh, the way I approach research, uh, some philosophers of education actually don't engage with what we might call in social sciences, for most education researchers, human data. So a lot of people don't gather data from humans. So I normally don't uh, gather data from people in the way that it's normally understood in educational research. Um, but I'm mostly grappling with different arguments. Uh, however, some philosophers of education just compare philosophies and just analyze philosophies very deeply. In my work, I've always tried to have a strong connection to empirical understandings and empirical arguments. So in my work, what I usually do is I look at current social debates and trace them out in terms of educational debates. So I do study policy texts. Uh, I usually study textbooks and curriculum documents. So if we're discussing uh, schools should help young people to have good mental and emotional well-being, is that in the curriculum? How is it described in the curriculum? Is there one sentence about that and then 20 sentences about helping the economy? Um, so I view that as a reflection of society, um, which is a little bit different than doing an interview or questionnaire, um, coding data, doing surveys, something like that. Um, and then I think sort of at the end of the day, what I'm interested in is making a moral argument about what should schools do. Uh, so a lot of educational research is focused more on is an intervention working in terms of certain criteria for what works. So um, if we do X in the classroom, then Y happens afterwards and sort of studying the relationship between the two or just simply in grounded research, exploring a certain community's experiences 
in detail. So uh, to put it very simply, I think most educational researchers focus on what is actually happening and what's going on in a certain context. Whereas for me, I'm interested in what should be going on, uh, which is a totally different question and it requires different resources, which are philosophical. Um, and I would argue as well as empirical, because once we have an idea what should go on, we should think about how does that relate to what we're actually doing. And I like how you put um, where you're concerned with the moral arguments of education. And I think this really aligns too with some a lot of your recent work about um, how you describe civic education as a process of learning how to live together. Um, how does this differ from traditional approaches? And then could you also expand on what education as learning to live together means? Yes, thank you for that. So this is something I've been thinking about for uh, for a long time is civic and moral education. And one thing that has been enorm enormously helpful for my understanding of civic and moral education is to work and live in different countries. So in the United States, there's not really a focus on moral education. It's known as a, like a controversial issue because it's related to religious education, the separation of church and state. Um, moral issues are seen as quite controversial compared to discussing politics per se. When I got to Hong Kong, it was actually the flip of that. And what is non-controversial is discussing morality and being a good person in society. Uh, whereas discussing civics and politics is becoming increasingly taboo in this context. Um, something else I was thinking about a lot as I was conceptualizing education for learning to live together is I think that a lot about what we learn about learning to live together in schools is under the surface and something that we might call a hidden curriculum. It's something, um, so if I ask you, what did you learn about being a good person and living with other people in society and schools, or what did you learn in civic education? You might say, I didn't learn anything. Uh, but what I like to do is look beneath the surface. Okay, we do have certain understandings which we hold about how to treat other people in the world, how to treat our neighbors, how to treat our family and friends, how to treat uh, people in our society, people who are similar to us, people who seem to be different from us, and how to treat people all around the world. So all of us do have an attitude about that. And we've learned that attitude from a variety of sources. One of those sources is schools. Schools is charged with um, something which we describe across countries as civic education, citizenship education, something like this. Um, but I want to argue that a lot of that content is not just in one subject, because most societies don't actually have a subject of civic education per se, um, but people learn about it through a variety of experiences in education. So they learn about it from history education. Uh, they learn about it from geography. Maybe when you're learning a second language, you learn some messages about how to treat diversity in your country or internationally, and just the attitudes of people around you. Um, and media is a big part of that too now. Uh, so for me, learning to live together, it, uh, focusing on that makes me discover a lot more than I would discover about this process if I was only focusing on the traditional curriculum. Uh, so most people who might study civic education across cultures might look at, okay, what is the subject in England? What is the subject in Hong Kong. So in England, it's, it's X and in Hong Kong, it's Y. Uh, but then you're actually gonna have a hard time comparing the two. In fact, in all societies, we do learn how to connect with people around the world, but we do that across curriculum. Uh, so I tried to really sort of flip the script. So in order to then start thinking about it systematically, um, because this is just so broad, I'm I, I wanna touch on everything here, um, but it is too broad and nobody knows about everything happening in the world. So in order to try to make it systematic, I created my own framework, which is learning to live together in concentric circles of uh, human connection. So starting with family and locale. So in kindergarten, everyone learns about their neighborhood. 
explain about your family, explain about your school community. Then you learn, eventually you learn about your nation state, your country. You might learn also about your local region or sort of the larger region. So in Hong Kong, of course, you're gonna learn about Hong Kong. You might also learn about Western civilization, Asian civilization, being an African, something like that, so being part of the European Union. And then you have the global community. So with that framework in mind, I think, how are people learning about these different levels of relation and how to connect with people across those levels of relation through education? And then that enables me to say, look, this is happening everywhere. Uh, because a lot of people will say, oh, we, we're lacking a moral education curriculum in the United States, or we're lacking a civic education curriculum in Hong Kong. But from this perspective, we can then dig down beneath the surface and see how there is education about living together and uh, connecting with people, but that um, education is just not a subject like learning to live in the nation state. That, that, that subject doesn't exist, but there are many lessons you can draw if you look at diverse sources um, in the school experience. So, so kind of linking the, the, the first question and the second question together, um, this question of moral education and um, moral argumentation in your work um, is an interesting one. And I, I wonder how you handle, uh, first of all, perhaps how you define morality and how that definition then, um, how, how it informs your philosophical argumentation. I guess I, could, I, guess I can hear some, some uh, questions or objections or something like this that morality tends to be thought of as kind of a prescriptive set of judgments. So how do you handle questions of, of value and judgment in your work in relation to moral argumentation and the gap between what schools do and what they sh what they should do as, as you were saying and perhaps maybe you could then link that back up to these different scales that you're talking about. Um, yeah. Yeah, so this is one of the most difficult questions. Um, and I find myself constantly interested in these moral questions. I actually used to be mostly interested in political questions. Maybe it's the influence of living in Hong Kong that's made me more interested in them as moral connections and seeing the relationship between what is moral and what is political. Um, because I think for me, so, so on the one hand, you have these political topics and people have different views about them. Um, and I'm starting to think about it more in education uh, as an individual experience. And then I think a moral argument becomes important because that's more about how an individual should treat and regard the world. Uh, but this is pretty difficult territory for sure. And I think this is something where people could say, there's some limitation or question my approach. Um, I, I, I do think it's possible that living in Hong Kong has really influenced me here because I'm feeling more and more a departure from a lot of my American colleagues who are puzzled. Why am I interested in these things as moral things? And I guess one of the challenges is that uh, when people think about morality, they think about uh, individual uh, person's experience and the fact that everyone has a different experience um, and we don't all sort of have the same uh, so there's a diversity of experiences, but we also don't have all the same sort of equalities and capacities and privileges and advantages in society. So here I'm thinking about, um, I'm often confronted with and, and having a dialogue with Martha Nussbaum's work, and I am attracted to, to liberal theory. I keep coming back to uh, Immanuel Kant for whatever reason, and there's a lot of people um, that a lot of thinkers I'm inspired by, but I often think about his, uh, his exploration of freedom and autonomy. And there, I mean, he was really focused on some basic moral principles. So, so I keep coming back to these myself, and I think they're shared across a lot of philosophies, although they're not always articulated in the strong way that some liberals will art articulate them. Um, basically treating everyone with respect, how to create a situation where everyone can be a person and develop in their own rights with their own actualization and realization. Uh, so, th so those for me are just critical, uh, really important things to think about, um, but they do take me back to a liberal tradition. And so the problem with a liberal tradition 
And the reason why I'm confronted with the work of some liberals today, like John Rawls or Martha Nussbaum, is they have this, you get a sense when they start making a detailed argument that they're talking about a very specific circumstance, which is their own circumstance. So, um, and Martha Nussbaum struggled with this in discussing cosmopolitanism. So this connects, I think, to some critiques I've received of my book, uh, Questioning Allegiance, which is that cosmopolitanism really assumes a certain um, framework where everyone's an individual and the whole world can come to a sort of universal perspective and come together and be on the same page. And I guess questions there are, is it possible for everyone to be on the same page and come to an agreement about the issues that really matter? Uh, is that the right approach to take when there's really sort of deep conflicts across groups? Uh, and I think, uh, so, so for, for Nussbaum, she actually went away and departed from a cosmopolitan view, um, saying at heart she's a liberal and she's more concerned with uh, sort of what is important for liberal societies in terms of treating an individual. Uh, so, so in Asian societies, the individual is not always treated as uh, such a significant player. Um, and what was the second part of, I don't know if, I don't think I answered everything you asked. I think I got confused by myself. <laughs> well, no, that's, 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 that's great. So you, you draw inspiration from uh, Kant and from the liberal tradition in thinking about how you negotiate questions of value and judgment and moral ar argumentation. I mean, the second question was, how do you um, negotiate a, these things across scales? But you're also talking about the individual, um, you know, the particular and the universal, the individual and the collective, and, and you're, you're already sort of, um, you're already sort of grappling that a little bit with your answer. Um, and I don't, I don't know if you'd like to say anything more about that, but that, that, that's, that's sort of where we were. Yeah, I mean, this is something, and this is something I keep coming back to, uh, the individual versus the collective. Uh, and I think, on the other hand, when we see what's happened in the last year in the United Kingdom and the United States, I think this is um, a critical point to think through. Is there too much, individual, um, too much individualism uh, in those countries? And is there not enough sense of the collective? So I'm increasingly interested in this, this relationship and how there's never really an absolute individual freedom, um, but that people always are sort of part of a collectivity. Um, and people have this sense that Confucianism and other Asian traditions there's no, no sense of self in those traditions, and that, that might be true for some senses of Buddhism. But um, actually, there's some interesting uh, connections uh, between Confucianism and liberalism. I mean, both of them support the sense that there's universal principles for treating each other. Uh, but then the, the place of relationships becomes more important in those contexts. Uh, so one thing I struggled with and one thing I hoped to articulate in questioning allegiance is that we learn to live together in these different, uh, what I would call spheres, in every society, but that looks different in every society, and there's different tensions in each of those societies. Uh, so I wound up at the end thinking, actually, even the sense of self and being a good person is taught about slightly different in, in different contexts. And that's what uh, actually drove me then to uh, do the research and write the book on Beyond Virtue is thinking through, actually so many of these things are deeply felt at the individual level. Um, and it's not just about how an individual treats people out there, but it's really about how each individual feels about the world around them. Uh, so this is, this is probably gonna be my main project for some time to come. And, and in part, it's probably just my own grappling with living in uh, Hong Kong. And before I lived in Hong Kong, I lived in South Africa and Abu Dhabi, which are also very um, more communal societies, more communitarian societies, and just grappling with, okay, what are the deeply felt views about the world, um, which are moral views. Uh, so, uh, so one thing, going back to moral philosophy, I think we all have these moral philosophies, but trying to actually 
put them out there and say, okay, what is the moral philosophy that we have? And let's really grapple with that because that's gonna be in tension with some other things in this contemporary world. Um, and I guess that's why I'm driven to moral philosophy, although it's maybe seen as um, conservative in some contexts. My goal isn't to say we should do what Kant says or what Confucius says or follow a strict moral code. It's more about, we have these assumptions which are about personal morality. And if we can work these out and elaborate them and bring them to light, uh, maybe we can, uh, we can help young people to really think about these things. Um, I think probably in the US there's a tendency to crystallize all these conversations as if they're about politics and identity. Um, and that's one way to do it, but that's not, not the way I'm thinking about it from Hong Kong today. So I also think that's actually great that you pointed to um, one of your other recent books, the, um, uh, Beyond Virtue, The Politics of Educating Emotions, because when you're talking about the different tensions between, say, the local or, or the individual and the collective, and then also moral education and civic education, but a lot of times the emotions and the feelings get there um, not really as accounted for in those conversations. Um, so for you, and, and you work through this in your book, what role do emotions play in that formation of you know, moral and civic education, and also in the formation of personal and political identity? And then I guess another way of asking this could be, how does actually attending to emotions present new insights uh, for understanding those tensions, the difference, and the, civil, uh, the social conflict? Yeah, that's a great question. And that, that basically encapsulates the, the problems I've been thinking about in my head for some time now. Uh, so, so how did I get to emotions? I think I started thinking about the relationship of people to each other. Um, I've, I think I started my academic journey thinking about political issues around identity. And um, I started out thinking about Islamophobia and so that's a feeling like phobia should be fear, but uh, it can also be twisted around into a kind of love. So this is something that Sarah Ahmed ta taught me, um, and she's probably my main, the main person who's really influenced me at this point. And also uh, in Beyond Virtue, I really rely quite heavily on uh, work done by Megan Bowler on uh, how emotions are political and they're part of education. So a lot of the tradition of liberal philosophers of education, especially coming from the United Kingdom, there's this focus, really, there's still a focus there on autonomy. And so I did my master's degree in, uh, in UK at Cambridge. So I think I was really influenced by that tradition when I first started doing research. Uh, so in that tradition, there's no place for feelings. So actually for Immanuel Kant, the less feelings, the better. Uh, the issue there, um, and something that Megan Buller points out, is there's really a neglect of the fact that there are emotions there, that a lot of the sort of traditional um, philosophers who say they're just focused on autonomy, they do have feelings, they might be stubborn, they might be inflexible, um, and they might just be afraid to talk about feelings. Uh, so, patriotism is also a feeling. It's a feeling of love of country. And so you see this really clearly in the United States in the last decade is that love of country becomes twisted around as implying a fear of certain others. Uh, so after 9-11, there was a lot of um, conservative educational policymakers who were saying that it's not compatible to love America and to not be hateful or negative or Islamophobic towards Muslims. Um, and so I was concerned there was a big conflation there. Um, and the media and education was then taking a role to encourage people to fear certain people. Uh, and you might say it's not fear, you might say it's actually hate or disgust. In any case, I think across societies, um, it, it's been my observation that people are given subtle messages in education and in society. Sometimes they're not subtle messages, but sometimes they are subtle, uh, which basically says there's an in-group and there's an out-group. And we need to uh, treat people differently based on whether they're in the in-group or out-group. 
and you need to demonstrate that and it becomes a part of demonstrating your patriotism as well. Um, and so something I've been struggling with when it comes to the focus on virtue ethics. Uh, so virtue ethics has become more popular in recent years as an approach to moral education in schools. Uh, there's an issue there that it doesn't really think about different identities in society and also different identities in the classroom. So once I started boiling down into what's happening in classrooms, I became really fascinated with how people have different roles and relations to each other and how different sort of identity markers make a difference in the classroom. And this is where there's a deep level of emotional education taking place that people haven't really been thinking about. So now there's really a contemporary push to teach about emotions, uh, to teach for well-being and resilience and mindfulness and these sorts of things. And there's an assumption that education hasn't really been looking at emotions before or has been focusing on academic emotions, as some psychologists call them, like just being curious or open. Um, people have always been concerned that young people shouldn't be angry or sad because then they're not going to learn well enough. But now there's a concern that learning about emotions also helps us play a positive role in society. So in that context, I also became interested in how does that play out in an actual classroom situation? Uh, so what I want to argue is we don't normally have a curriculum around emotion. So similar to civic education, there's not a curriculum there, but if you look beneath the surface, there are things happening. So gratitude's very hot topic now. Young people definitely learn at school how to have gratitude. They learn to thank guests in the class, to thank people. So that's part of an education for gratitude. Um, then if you look at the next level down within a classroom sort of micro environment, People are also taught different lessons. And I so this is an argument that I would make. Uh, if you survey different groups, if you survey men and women uh, about how important gratitude is, uh, so they did this research in the UK, they found that women think gratitude is more important than men do. Similarly, uh, Christians tend to hold gratitude in higher regard than some other groups. So what I wanna argue here is it's not like this natural biological feature of women or Christians that they're just naturally grateful. They're learning it. And I think what happens in schools is people have unconscious bias. Uh, so if a little boy in my class says thank you and they're very sarcastic about it, I might think, okay, that's fine. You know, he doesn't have to be thankful. If the little girl seems sarcastic. I might um, not be as nice to her. And then she might learn from that lesson. She might learn, oh, I have to really show my sort of deep undying gratitude in order for my teacher to like me. So I wanna argue that those things happen to people all the time um, and that it happens differently here in Hong Kong compared to America, but it does happen in both places. Um, and so I'm still exploring this issue. I loved writing uh, the book Beyond Virtue and learning about it. And I'm still thinking about it all the time here in Hong Kong because uh, Hong Kong's influenced by such a different tradition than the United States. Uh, so there's a lot of interesting things there and I'm still exploring them. I have a new project actually with a group of colleagues at my university. Um, we're calling it VIEW, V-I-E-W, VIEW Lab, Virtues in Education, East Meets West. Um, and so, like I said before, some people think virtues is a very conservative idea, but we're not interested in just promoting virtues per se. We're not just interested in saying young people have to learn how to have uh, gratitude and humility and how to be open-minded. That's not our goal. Our goal is to think through um, what does this have to do with human relations and connections and with our perception of what a community should be like, which definitely looks different in um, Hong Kong and Confucian heritage context versus very strictly liberal contexts like US and UK. Um, so sp speaking of Hong Kong, in, in your book, Contesting Education and Identity in Hong Kong, you talk about Hong Kong, you use um, Benedict Anderson's imagined community. And you talk about how belonging in this context is um, a complicated question. And so we want to talk to you a little bit. We want to dig a little bit deeper into your, to your work in Hong Kong. Um, so this question of an imagined community um, is, is sort of one level. 
and who belongs and who doesn't, but also you yourself as a Westerner who works in Hong Kong, um, writes about um, uh, social, educational, cultural, moral, political issues. Um, so how do you, could you, could you speak a little bit about um, Hong Kong as an imagined community and also your own positionality uh, with, within that? Yeah, so I always liked Anderson's work uh, and I think it's really applicable to Hong Kong because Hong Kong shows the process. So Anderson makes this historical argument about um, a lot of different countries like United States and, and how it went from not existing to existing. Um, in Hong Kong, that's really taken place. It's still taking place, um, but it's been taking place for the last hundred years. Uh, so Hong Kong, 150 years ago, uh, the British were calling it a barren rock at the same time that the British were saying, this is our barren rock. Um, they, were, they were using very um, blunt language to act like it didn't exist. It did exist, um, but actually today that identity is contested. Some people will say it was always part of Chinese territory um, and it was part of Chinese territory at the time. But then what China was several hundred years ago is different than it is today in terms of the boundaries and the leadership and the principles behind it. Um, so Hong Kong has seen many um, transformations of its identity um, during the British colonial period, which just, last, uh, which just ended recently, just in the last few decades, they avoided giving people a sense of identity. And some historians use this term uh, transitization to describe how Hong Kong was not seen as a place to live your life, it was seen as a place to make money. So a lot of people from mainland China, from the rest of the world were coming here to make money, not to settle down. And uh, so in the book, I try to trace what's happening in society to what's happening in education. So at that same time, the British uh, directors of education would say things like, we can't possibly design an education system for this place. It would be like designing an education system for people going through a uh, Charing Cross station in the UK, like people going through a train station, that's impossible. People only really started to have a sense of Hong Kong identity near the end of the British period. Um, I mean, there's some debate about this and different groups have different experiences. Uh, but in terms of conceptualizing, we are Hong Kong people and what does this mean? That only started happening at a social level, which manifests in the education system in the 80s. Um, because at that time, they knew they had to prepare for the handover to China. So they wanted people to understand, okay, you're part of Hong Kong and you're part of China. And there's really interesting research done with teachers at that time, because teachers were never, the people who were teachers then, when they were students, they were never told, let's learn what it means to be a Hong Kong person. What, let, what's, let's learn what it means to be a Chinese person. So they were flabbergasted. In fact, for most of the British period, any political conversation was banned because they didn't want people to be rioting about politics. Uh, so a lot of people said, I'm really confused. I wasn't supposed to talk about in politics in school, and now I'm supposed to teach young people about their political identity. What is a political identity? Um, that might be part of why I'm talking about things these days in terms of morality rather than politics is simply because there's not a history of talking about Hong Kong issues in, uh, as political issues. So people feel uh, quite anxious about that. And that anxiety has uh, continued on to this day. Um, and people are still debating what does it mean to be uh, a Hong Kong person. When I, I don't know if I told you about this before, but when I started writing Questioning Allegiance, uh, which was about learning to live together in all of these concentric circles and how we all learn how to live together in concentric circles. That book, I'd, I'd actually proposed it as a book about Hong Kong. And I did that about five or six years ago. And at that time, the publishers, I sent it to all of these publishers around the world. They all said it looks great, but I don't think anyone really cares about a book about Hong Kong. And this made me really frustrated because I thought Hong Kong is so unique but it also reveals something about the rest of the world. So in Hong Kong, there's this tension around 
what does it mean to be patriotic? Does it mean to be part of Hong Kong or part of China? And that tension also relates to something which one of my favorite uh, Hong Kong theorists, Wing On Lee, he talks about uh, localized internationalization and um, delocalized nationalization. So there's a conflict between a Hong Kong with uh, basic law and free rights in the constitution and this liberal foundation started by the British and the Chinese government system and the values associated with those. So now in the curriculum, you'll see people, uh, you'll see the curriculum will say, people should learn about universal values and Chinese values to show that there's a tension between the two. Um, I wanna suggest that this tension, we are seeing this today with people in Scotland wanting to rejoin the EU while the UK um, generally is taking a step back. Uh, places like Portland, New York, Hawaii have these global identities uh, that are sort of in clashing with the national identity. Uh, so that's something I'm very fascinated with. And this also connects to there being different concepts of patriotism that we're actively working out today. So what makes America great again is actually something people, people have different ideas about what makes America great, um, which lies underneath the surface of if you're going to agree with certain slogan or wear that hat that says that or not. Similar here in Hong Kong, people are arguing about what is actually patriotism. So I try to contribute to those debates and uh, just with my teaching in my classes to show that there's different views. Um, and so my point in learning to live together and in, quest uh, uh, in questioning allegiance and in the book about Hong Kong is these things are happening, but they're happening in complicated ways uh, with diverse concepts of what it means to be patriotic or to be part of a place. And they continue to happen uh, actively today. And so when you're talking to about Hong Kong, because your work in your book is actually situated squarely within the protest movements that have erupted in Hong Kong since the umbrella movement of 2014 and the more recent protests over the anti-extradition and security laws. And so for those, I mean, it's also too how we shared about the uh, question of allegiance that's originally supposed to be about Hong Kong. And five years ago, they said, no, who wants to read it? But now we have so much stuff coming out. However, for those listeners who may not be very familiar, could you talk a bit about these protests and also their relationship to education and specifically youth identity? Yes, so I think uh, that's, that's one reason I've stayed so focused on the protests. So I never saw myself as someone who is doing research on politics per se or protests per se, or before I came to Hong Kong, youth civic engagement wasn't my main uh, topic is actually the first year that I came to Hong Kong, they had a big debate over moral and national education. And uh, that debate was the first time that Joshua Wong was on the national scene. So now Joshua Wong, he became so famous during the umbrella movement as, as he wasn't the only late leader of that movement, but he became the most internationally famous. And since then he's gotten a lot of press um, in the Western world and still has the capacity to reach a lot of people by writing and being featured in Western world. So he was actually uh, the leader of a group at that time called Scholarism. They were against a new subject in the Hong Kong curriculum called moral and national education. And at the time I was brand new to Hong Kong and I became really fascinated with the idea um, that this new curriculum was going to brainwash people. And I found it really interesting because when I looked at what the curriculum said and I analyzed it in terms of the work I'd done on curriculum before, um, my sense was the messages in the curriculum were not actually all that different from the messages that are in the existing curriculum. Um, so what was actually being presented as a risk of being brainwashed, a risk of being indoctrinated, uh, was more about the method rather than the contents. I mean, there was a lot of debate over the content. Um, we have these debates in the United States as well, like there's too much positive, you know, are we going to say positive things about our history or are we going to say negative things about the history? Do young people need to learn um, that the country's a wonderful place? And then in high school, you start telling them a bit more about the dark side. 
um, or can you start with the dark side? So there was that part of the debates, but it was also a larger debate. Um, and it also made me learn about how there's a strong sense in Hong Kong, a strong concern with brainwashing and a strong concern that people in China are brainwashed. Uh, and the research on that is actually really interesting as well. Uh, so this is a very hard topic to research. And this is why I think I have a very different view as a philosopher of education than some other educational researchers. Um, so if you're in a society where you have, where you don't have the right to publicly express dissent, and then a researcher asks you what you think about things, you're not going to express dissent to the researcher. Um, so some people tend to assume in that case that people are brainwashed. Uh, I don't think that that's the case. I think people have their own views. And in fact, some research shows, so, so some research by my colleague Gregory Fairbrother, he looked at Hong Kong young people and uh, mainland Chinese young people around the time of the handover. And he saw that, that both societies, people are critically thinking. Um, but it drives me crazy because the media always shows this case that the Hong Kong students are liberalized and the mainland students um, are brainwashed and indoctrinated. And I think this is just such a complete uh, overgeneralization, oversimplification of what's going on in Hong Kong. Um, so anyways, in the moral and national education debate, they were successful and they shelved the curriculum. And the chief executive at that time, C.Y. Lung said, yeah, this isn't this important to us. I don't think they were expecting such a strong backlash. So people across the society protested. Um, the Umbrella Movement, too, was a big surprise to everyone in Hong Kong. And there was a sense of Hong Kong youth. So when I first came to Hong Kong, the discourse was Hong Kong youth are politically apathetic. They're politically apathetic because they have no civic education. Um, they are not really paying attention to what's happening. And this is a problem. We need to help them to learn about their identity. And I think a lot of people would agree with that, um, that they need to learn about their identity. Uh, so in the umbrella movement, uh, it sort of morphed from a movement led by uh, Occupy Central with Peace and Love, which was about uh, developing internationally um, recommended and recognized standards for democratic voting for all of the leaders of Hong Kong. And if the government is sort of, there's a sense of stalling and a lot of arguments about that and that not being um, something that has, should happen according to the timetable expected and a lot of panic, which continues to this day that it's not gonna happen. And the system, there's gonna be a system in place which is not, um, which is not, very free or representative of Hong Kong people, uh, but it's just going to be accepted in society. Uh, so, so they said we're going to occupy Central if this doesn't, if if we don't see positive changes in this time frame. And actually, there was sort of a conflict in that movement where young people really took over the movement. Uh, and the most astonishing thing, though, and the thing that made everyone around the world pay attention, was the use of uh, tear gas by police. And it actually wasn't a big movement until that moment. After that moment, the movement exploded because people th thought that that was a police overreaction. Uh, so a lot of scholars say this movement wouldn't have existed if, if it weren't for this particular set of circumstances. Um, but this ended up being a very um, educational mo moment for people. So this is where I, um, as a philosopher of education, I'm not trying to say something particularly partisan or political here, just to make an observation that people learn from these experiences, that they are educational experiences. Young people like took over central Hong Kong for, for months and months and months, they took it over. And a lot of other people in society thought it was an interesting thing. Um, not necessarily a terrible thing, maybe bad for the economy, uh, but a lot of people found it very interesting and inspiring. Um, and since then, there's been a lot of grappling with uh, the role of young people, which, which there wasn't that grappling with it in the past. So I felt like I had to um, 
do research on all of these topics as they were as they were taking place. It was really funny because when I applied for the job in Hong Kong, uh, I remember they interviewed me and they said, well, you do research on Islamophobia and religion and education. So I don't really see. Um, so what do you think you'll do research on here in Hong Kong? I said, yeah, I'm not sure because I also look at patriotism and education, but that doesn't seem to be like a hot topic here. And the people who interviewed me, I think the people who interviewed me knew better than I did. They just said, yes, yeah, not too big of a deal. And then I came here, the moral and national education debate happened. So I had to get, um, as a researcher, I had to dive into that curriculum and start figuring out what was really happening. What are people saying? What's the meaning behind what they're saying? Um, when it came to the umbrella movement, why were people participating? What did it mean for people? Um, and a lot of people drew very strong um, educational messages from that. So it really was a youth event and an educational event for a lot of people. Um, and now what we've seen most recently is a new generation of protesters um, in, the, in the national security law protests of last year. At the same time, COVID has changed everything and Hong Kong people um, are not predisposed when there is a pandemic to break the rules of society about social distancing. People here feel very strongly about that. Um, so for a number of reasons, a uh, number of political reasons and due to COVID, all these things have come to a halt at this time. Uh, so I put the book on the back burner and I wrote Questioning Allegiance and I thought this book I want to, I was irritated and motivated to write it. I thought I want to send messages to everyone in the world about what I'm learning about in Hong Kong and how it's interesting to people around the world. So how can I make it not about Hong Kong? And that was a good exercise for me. Um, and, and I really enjoyed doing it. But I kept working on the Hong Kong book. And then about a year ago, life just stopped here. And I thought, okay, am I going to write this book or not? And I kept, I kept writing it and writing it. Because um, I'd also done research on liberal studies curriculum, um, which also is a hot topic in this context. And then I thought, I'm just going to finish this and stop writing about it because it's also very politically stressful. And I feel a lot of tension, like personally, you know, if someone says, what do you work on? And I say, I'm writing a book about Hong Kong protests. Um, I, I, all of a sudden, I have to have a big political discussion with People and I, I find that a little tiring and stressful sometimes. So I thought, okay, I'm just going to get this out here. I don't feel like it's complete or, or perfect, uh, but it's the world we live in. So I also feel like I wanted to sort of represent a living history to some extent too, you know, because who knows, in, in 10 years, I'll have a different view about these things. Uh, but, but there's no way I would have written the same book in 10 years, that's for sure. Uh, so, so I just tried to get it out there. Yeah, so on that note, I mean, one question we have for you is sort of where do you think things are headed? But to, we want to load up that question a little bit more. So um, this question of liberal studies, which you kind of mentioned in passing uh, a couple of moments ago, um, in the book, you talk about this liberal studies uh, curriculum that the authorities kind of blame this uh, curriculum for having a corrupting influence on, on young people. And also, um, this week, I saw a story in the BBC about um, a mandate that the security law should be taught in schools. Um, and the BBC reports, primary school students will also be taught how to sing and respect the national anthem and learn about how the People's Liberation Army protects Hong Kong. Older students will learn about the limits of Hong Kong's rights and freedoms. Schools are required to stop students and teachers from singing specific songs. Uh, a nod to a trend in schools last year where, tr tr where children would drown out the Chinese national anthem with protest songs. Um, and I find this particularly interesting at this moment in time um, because for a number of different reasons. Um, and in, in these different contexts, so in the, in the United States, um, before Trump was to leave office, he wanted to mandate a national patriotic education, which would, um, which was positioned explicitly against um, critical theory or critical race theory or 
forms of historical investigation into um, slavery in America's past and things like this, but sort of, oh, I don't know, forms of knowledge and inquiry that the state, or at least the conservative right-wing Trump administration views as deeply problematic. In the UK, recently, the education minister wants to, um, you know, legislate from a right-wing perspective notions of free speech. Emmanuel Macron recently in France has made comments about social science, left-wing social science theories from American universities creating the uh, uh, the decline of French, that, that are in, um, contributing to the decline of French civilization. Hung, in Hungary, um, there's been, um, loyal, professors have had to take loyalty oaths. Um, so I think we just see sort of these reactionary trends globally in education. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about how this sort of this current development around the security law and mandating teaching the security law, but also the context in Hong Kong and how it sort of um, uh, fits in with this larger sort of context. Also, finally, I know I'm asking about 10 different questions at once right now. Where is all of this headed? Yeah, this is, uh, this is a really crazy time uh, and it is very alarming. Um, and I guess, I, I've certainly been thinking about it because I do talk to teachers on a regular basis here in Hong Kong who who think I'm going to have some answers, which I really don't. But there's things I say when people ask. So, um, so I, I have been thinking about how to respond to these questions, I guess. Uh, OK, so I think to start with taking Hong Kong as an example, um, one one concern I've had, I mentioned I've been frustrated with the way Hong Kong seen as liberal and China has seen as illiberal. Yes, in some sense, that's of course um, a reasonable way to see the world, but there's been this discussion of liberal studies. And so one of my first big projects when I came to Hong Kong was to do research on the liberal studies curriculum. And when liberal studies was introduced, um, it was introduced with a lot of controversy. So one thing I found very gratifying in writing the book about Hong Kong um, and doing deeper and deeper research, like for example, national security law was the big impetus for uh, dissent this last year. There was already, there was a big debate about it and big protest about it uh, decades ago too. So one thing that's interesting for me is to see how there's all these cycles and how um, the young people I was teaching 10 years ago in the umbrella movement are totally different than the young people today. And they don't remember what happened 10 years ago. Uh, so it's really fascinating to think about generationally. Um, but in any case, liberal studies was very controversial. There was this idea that it was going to liberalize. Um, and I think it was called liberal studies because it was getting at liberal arts. And I think what happened is in the initial controversy, they took out all of the things that we imagine that curriculum would do. Um, when we imagine, so according to the newspaper articles, it teaches about rights and freedoms. Uh, and there's this opposition painted between that and civic education. What I found was the curriculum is, um, if anything, there's a hidden curriculum underneath liberal studies, which is patriotic, pro-China civic education. So, so my um, research on it focused on multiculturalism and how diversity was treated. Um, and so when I first started doing my research, I thought Chinese diversity is one form of diversity. What I saw was the textbooks were constantly describing Hong Kong as a Chinese society. And uh, in that context, saying how wonderful it was to be part of China, um, and everything that civic and moral education would do, that civic and national education would do, uh, liberal studies was sending those messages. Likewise, there's been big debates here about history. So I know in the US, the big debates have been about history. And the debates, you can trace them throughout the, the history of the last three or four decades in Hong Kong. And the history curriculum all, already teaches a very strongly patriotic message and a very nationalistic message about China's role in the world, about Hong Kong as a Chinese society. Today, some of the history textbooks 
notes don't mention that Hong Kong was ever part of the UK, or they might say something like, um, there was a brief period where Hong Kong was part of the UK, but really it's always been part of Chinese society. So all of that's been being wiped away in the curriculum. Um, and indeed now they seem to be getting rid of liberal studies altogether. Um, so a lot of people are saying this is a terrible thing, but but what I see, um, so what I see in the media is a lot of people discussing these things, but don't seem to be focused on a great deal of research. Uh, so it's possible that liberal studies had a role in these movements. Uh, so a lot of people did say that liberal studies had a role in these movements. Most of the media was quoting either politicians saying that or teachers saying that, but there's not really any research based as there is research done about liberal studies and about what schools did during the, the recent series, the various recent series of protests in Hong Kong, there's really no connection to liberal studies. It's possible that the focus on critical thinking or exploring issues in dialogue, which are controversial, which um, there's not one perfect right answer. Um, the idea that you have to have a role in society and engage in independent inquiry and participate in your community. Those things could be said to be related to young people's civic engagement and engaging in protests. And those are things that people want to take away from the curriculum in the future. So some people with a pro mainland perspective are saying, um, we need like, they say there shouldn't be useless conversations in classrooms. Uh, so I think we are going to see in Hong Kong a trends towards more and more um, patriotic and civic education. What I teach my students is there's so many different kinds of patriotism, but a particular form of patriotism here is becoming in vogue. I think in the US and in Hong Kong and around the world, there's one patriotism where uh, you love your country, but you think loving your country means to criticize it and to take care of people and to be concerned about justice and rights. And then there's another patriotism which is to more or less blindly support leaders. And I think that form is uh, really desired in terms of this sense of uh, populism in a lot of countries around the world that people shouldn't be critically thinking and protesting. They should be doing what they're told. Um, so I guess I have one flip side to this um, or one sort of, positive lesson that I take from all of this. I used to, see, to say when I was doing my research about multiculturalism in US education and Islamophobia, I used to say uh, there, teachers do different things. Teachers have different beliefs and they have different attitudes. And uh, it's a good thing that there's not a camera in every classroom because Teachers, we don't know what every teacher does, but there's diversity. There's diversity of views in society and that diversity is unfolded in education. Um, now there's really this terrible idea. Um, I think it's terrible for um, free speech and free thought, which is that we could put cameras in every classroom. So people are saying this could happen in China. They could put cameras in every classroom. Make sure, make sure that people are, are towing the party line appropriately, being patriotic appropriately. So all of this is pretty scary. So I guess there's two, there's like two positive things I could say in this context. One positive thing I could say is that there's often um, horror stories that don't come true. And sometimes, so like politicians will say things and I will see people in Hong Kong get very worried about what they say but it's just one politician saying it to be popular with other people. So same thing in America, like, a polit but, but sometimes they do what they do achieve what they want to achieve. Right. Um, that is true, but often they don't often they're just saying something provocative. And on the other side, there's often people who are afraid of these trends who are also quoted in the media. So the media quotes the people with the darkest views and that's not always what's going to happen. Um, I mean, that's kind of, um, uh, that's just something to think about. It's, it's not really convincing. We don't know what's going to happen in the future. Uh, but the other thing I think that, that gives me hope in this time is, and something I say to teachers is 
we've been drilling patriotic education into everyone in Hong Kong systematically year after year and debating it for 30 years. And it turns out that everyone in society has their own unique view and we can still talk about them. Uh, and in, like I said before, in mainland China, like not being able to express a view is not, is different from not having a view. So I don't believe that brainwashing like works um, in the way that people have this simple view that brainwashing works. Um, one thing that's going to happen in the future is we're going to start using some words to, to say things. So, so all the words are going to have different meanings because there's certain things that we can't say. And then um, this sounds dystopian in a way, but it's already happening in Hong Kong. There's certain slogans that seem completely innocuous that certain people think are terrible slogans and you might get in trouble for saying those slogans. So those are being replaced with other slogans. Um, and I mean, people say that this is, uh, this is all going in a really downward trend and it's, it's hard not to imagine that it is going in a downward trend, uh, but, but we can never predict the future, you know, for, for um, in the eight, in the eighties and the nineties and the early two thousands, everyone thought that the future of the planet was going to be cosmopolitan peace and an end of nations, you know, so maybe now that we think everything is getting really dark, um, our worst fears won't be uh, figured out. I mean, I also I also take some inspiration from from young people. Like every generation is different than the one before. They're all learning from what we're doing. They want to be different. Every generation looks at the generation before with a lot of moral judgment. I would argue, and they take a different tactic to everything. And they're people. People age out of, of society, um, society grows and changes. So, so it doesn't seem like there's anything very positive we can do today, um, but we can wait and see. I, it makes me want to study uh, philosophy of history because I often feel like we're in such a dark moment in history, uh, but, but you learn, like I learned that we've had these debates so many times in Hong Kong about the exact same thing. And people were terrified it was the end of Hong Kong decades ago. And it breaks my heart when people say Hong Kong's dead or the death of Hong Kong. Um, people have been saying that for decades and decades. And I don't see Hong Kong being dead myself. Um, so, and we've had, you know, terrible global pandemics before in human history as well. Uh, and so I wonder, yeah, there is a sense, I do have a sense that things are quite bad around the world today. Um, and it's, yeah, I think it'd be great to do more sort of philosophical studies of the perception of, of history. Um, so yeah, dark times. <laughs> oh, Liz, too, when you're talking about um, a couple of things, uh, points about from what you said with um, how there's, like when you're giving the example of like the teachers and that you know all the teachers have a, a diversity of how they approach it because you know everyone's different different experiences kind of to kind of shift that maybe from teachers and education to more of the research and writing and the different projects that have come out um in the journals and in recent years the, i think this is an interesting shift um you have contributed to a number of collective writing projects which is yeah, you know, completely different shift in academic writing, and have also written about contemporary academic publishing. So, for you, what is collective writing, and how does collective writing fit within the broader landscape of academic publishing today? And I think this, and I maybe it, I see it connecting to the conversation we've been having because why collective writing and why now? Mm hmm. Yeah, so I really enjoy collective writing. Um, I think I think all academic writing is influenced by peer review processes. So I find peer review processes really interesting for a number of reasons. Uh, in peer review processes, you are confronted with the the fact that your view is not held by your reviewers, and they might not get your view. They might not be convinced by your arguments, and you basically have to, you have to engage with their perspective in order to get your work published. Uh, but what often happens with academic peer review is it seems like a conflict 
And I've had experiences with academic publishing where I don't feel like they're being very nice to me. I feel like they're basically saying, I hate your writing and it doesn't deserve to be published. And then I feel like I'm like having an argument with them about that. And in that process, I also feel like I have to make compromises about my position. Like this person doesn't want to have a conversation with me. This person's not being my friend. But if I don't, if I don't edit my text about their views, then I can't publish my views. Um, so there's like a, a compromise there, but it's not a friendly compromise. Uh, and the, I think this is not like the proper spirit of peer review. The proper spirit of peer review is people trying to help each other, trying to make your argument um, understandable to a broader audience and realizing that people don't hold the same views as you and you can strengthen your, your arguments by connecting to a broader audience. So I think with collective writing, that process is um, really enabled that positive process of peer review. So in collective writing, you write side by side and you can discover through writing um, about the exact same thing that you have different views about that. Um, or if you take di different aspects of a topic uh, and connect them to each other, you can simply learn more because there's more people involved. Um, it hasn't been that common in educational research and philosophy of education before recently to do collective writing, but scientists have often done collective writing in the sense that they have labs. So one person in the lab is uh, making the money and knows how to get things published. One person in the lab is doing the data collecting. One person is doing the data analysis and then they all write together. Um, so you can think about it in a, even in a mechanical way like that, you can really achieve more and get a sense um, and, and do more and have a more holistic view. So one reason I like writing books is because I wanna make an argument that's more than one, one article's worth of argument. I wanna make an argument like society should do X or society is doing X. And I don't feel like I can make that argument effectively in just one article, which should have sort of one smaller argument. In a collective essay, uh, you can take advantage of the fact that everyone has these backgrounds of thought already and they can combine and sort of crystallize the best part of the research they've done um, and put it together to make something quite interesting. So it's almost like a miniature book. Um, if, each, if you think each person's writing their own article and then combining them together. And there's also an intrinsic peer review process that happens in collaborative writing because in that process, my name's on the text. I didn't write this section, but my name's on the text. So I wanna make sure that I understand that writing and it's clear to me. Um, so, and of course, in an article, there needs to be a consistent voice to some extent. Um, I mean, sometimes you can have each section has a different author, but you also wanna make sure there's some kind of coherency or larger picture. So in that way, a group of people's voice is uh, contributing to a greater whole. Um, we've done some recent projects lately doing snapshots of the field where we'll ask a number of people in the field to give their comments on a question. And we might see the author's name by each of the contributions, but then we're enabled to do a snapshot. So philosophers of education are not inclined to, um, you, might, you might do a snapshot by giving everyone in the field a survey and then analyzing the data of the survey and then saying, okay, this is what people think. Um, but that's not really, um, philosophers would have issues with the methodology of doing that perhaps. So we can do these snapshots where we say, okay, these are sort of the, the range of issues that people care about. So I did a recent um, essay on snapshots on US uh, North American philosophers of education and their views about what philosophy of education should do in the future. And there you see what issues crop up. Um, a lot of reckoning with Black Lives Matter the recent aftermath and a sense that the field should be engaging more deeply with urgent issues in society than it has been. Um, and I guess I'm, I'm comparing it now with a social science approach. What is interesting there is you get the richness of each philosopher's argument um, and you get a taste for that. And then you can also see how people's arguments connect with each other, but are also distinct from each other. So, it's really, I think, a unique form of arguments. Like even if I said, okay, I'm gonna try to make 
10 slightly different perspectives on this question. They're all going to be my view based on my background and my, my um, history of scholarship. So collective writing, I think, gives you the chance to, to really get a richness and a, a variety of insights in 6,000 words or less, um, which you can't normally get in the field. Um, one of the things, I, since really since I, I got tenure last year, I've um, not really purposefully purposefully done this, but I just have a desire to collaborate with people more so than doing things on my own. So right now I'm co-writing a book with somebody. Amy and I are doing this. And maybe this project, talking to you and, and other people um, you know, in this program is maybe some of it had to do with COVID. I'm not sure because maybe we just you know, want some more contact with others and, and discussing ideas than we're getting because we're not able to be in a classroom or something like this. Um, but what I, I guess one of the things I'm trying to say here and, and we're sort of you know, um, on the verge of wrapping up is that you know, the contemporary university the contemporary life of scholarship, um, being a professor, is one of like really intensive individualization. And I'm just wondering if like these collective writing pro projects are not just maybe simply about form and, and what the form can bring, but also just kind of a desire to, to ha have a different model of, of, of exchange of thought and ideas um, and maybe, you know, hopefully that can have some kind of pedagogical value too, you know, when people come together and, and um, in that way. Um, at, at least for me lately, inspiration has come from, from these forms of collaboration and having, having these kinds, kinds of discussions. But for you, um, our final question for you is like, what continues to provide you inspiration and, and motivation for doing your work? Um, I really agree with what you said about collaboration. Um, and yes, there is a, a pedagogical benefit too. And that's so, so the projects I'm working on now, I'm doing collaboration because I want to learn from other people. And at the same time, I can learn from what other people have done while I also um, can help them to develop themselves. So, so all of us have different strengths and weaknesses. I've always tried to teach this to my students when I teach them that they should do peer reviews. Um, but, but one thing um, that's been a joy to me lately is I can provide opportunities for people. I can provide opportunities for them to do um, interesting research while I also learn from the research that they do. So that's, I think that's the best part of um, being an academic for me. Um, it's hard, I've, I've been thinking a lot about academic freedom lately um, in the context of Hong Kong, and also as I've been able to pursue topics that I'm more interested in, and that's where the really the joy comes in for me. Uh, and I think I'm starting to enjoy collaborating more in that context um, in order to learn more from others and uh, to see how my work is, is taken up by others and expanded on by others. Um, yeah, so, so I definitely agree with you that being in a community is valuable. I also just moved uh, recently, I changed universities. Um, and in my old university, there weren't a lot of people who had similar interests to me who I could collaborate with. But in my new institution, um, I'm ending up doing a lot more uh, research collaboration. And I think it can be really fun if you're working with the right people in the right spirit. And I say that not in an elitist way, like some people are better than others, but the, on the other hand, there are these pressures of the university that bog you down, these ideas that you're gonna be fired if you don't do enough work and that your work only counts if it's individual. So these pressures make people turn away from each other. Um, but I think it's really important that people do the research they want to do for, for their own motivation, so they feel good about what they're doing. Um, being part of a community, uh, I don't believe anyone can do good research in isolation because the, the purpose is to communicate uh, your findings and your views with other people. Um, and it's always going to strengthen the work to connect with other people. Uh, so, so it's definitely a bad thing that the university encourages us to be very individualistic, especially early on in our career. So that's why I think, you know, once you get tenure, and I recently was promoted to professor, then you really have the luxury of not just working for yourself, 
um, but working with other people. And I even feel a little bit selfish when I work with other people because I learn things from other people. And I feel like I learn from the work that they do. Um, and we can work back and forth that way. But you can only really think that way if you're not thinking, okay, I need 10 single author publications in the next year or something like that. Um, so, so I guess in terms of inspiration, I'm the most inspired when I think I can write about the things that matter to me that are important topics that I can share my view and be part of a community. And <clears throat> I think it's, <clears throat> I think it's, of course, I'm, I always, this always happens at the end of a lecture or, or class. <clears throat> I don't know if I get emotional or what, or what happens. Um, but I think it's great that you guys are doing this uh, podcast because it, it can be disheartening and especially in the time of COVID to feel like you're just working and talking to yourself. So it gives me so much joy to imagine you guys reading my work and finding it interesting. So I think that's really what it should be all about. And hopefully we can keep doing more alternative um, formats of academic writing. At least universities want us to have impact nowadays and knowledge exchange. Um, so we really have to embrace these moments, not to have some kind of like fake, oh, here's my knowledge exchange, here's what I did, but to actually show um, we're, we're trying to connect to each other across, across borders and boundaries and across different groups. Um, so I think that's great. So I also have a lot to learn from you two about, um, about this topic of collaboration as well. Well, uh, thank you for, for, for talking with us today. It's been a pleasure to learn more about your work and we hope that we can continue this conversation in the future as well. Yeah, definitely. I hope so too. It was a lot of fun. So thanks, thanks for hosting me today. Thank you so much, Liz.